CB8 Speaks, a monthly program of Community Board 8 Manhattan. The Community Board is defined by the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island, and the Upper East Side being from East 59th Street to East 96th Street from the East River to Fifth Avenue. And this program tonight is part of a retrospective series where we speak to members of the community who have served for many years on the Community Board and are here to share their insights and their objective opinions of what is going on in our area and of the Community Board. And tonight, we're really, really pleased to have Sharon Pope Marshall here. She is right now the co-chair of Zoning and Development, and she is a member of the Roosevelt Island Committee and the Parks and Waterfront Committees. Sharon's also executive director of Civitas, a not-for-profit organization which is engaged with citizens concerned for the quality of urban life in Manhattan's Upper East Side, East Harlem, along the East River. Sharon recently was honored with an Audi Award, which is presented by Our Town Magazine, which recognizes remarkable New Yorkers who make the Upper East Side and New York in general a better place to live. So Sharon, thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Monica. Sharon, um, let's get started. Just tell people about yourself. You know what? That's a great question and uh, one I just want to dive directly into. Um, but I think the best way uh, to tell my story is also to tell the story of Civitas. And about 15 years ago, uh, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, while on the community board, I began hearing about Civitas. As a matter of fact, when I first joined the community board, it was just after uh, Civitas was successful in forcing a developer to remove several illegal floors from a building um, at uh, 96th Street. And uh, you know what? I said, wow, that's chutzpah. Uh, you know what? But that's an organization that I would love to volunteer with. It's an organization that focuses on uh, the urban quality of life on the Upper East Side, as well as El Barrio East Harlem. And I began as a volunteer with Civitas. And I uh, wrote newspaper articles. I was on the newsletter committee. Uh, and then I became a member of the board of directors. And after that, I co-chaired the land use and zoning committee. And just last year, I, I stepped down to become uh, the executive director of Civitas. That's really exciting. And what are the kinds of issues does Civitas deal with? Sure. It's a variety of issues uh, focusing on uh, what we see day to day as we walk the streets. Uh, Civitas is, uh, has a board of directors that is very engaged and very hands-on. And they are um, active in the community. They walk the streets in the community. And what they see happening is what is reflected uh, within Civitas and our committee structure. So for example, um, we have the Esplanade Committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2011, we hosted an exhibition um, at the City of the Museum of New York um, regarding the Esplanade and the need for additional funding uh, for the Esplanade. Uh, some of the projects that, that we uh, work on are very long-term projects. Um, again, we, we started focusing on um, the Esplanade at around 2010, 2009. Uh, there's also, uh, and, and subsequently, uh, you know, Civitas and other groups, we were able to, to get significant funding, almost $284 million, uh, directed uh, to the Esplanade. And uh, another area that we're focusing on is parks and open space, specifically the Marx Brothers Playground, um, as an example. And that falls under a category of jointly operated playgrounds. There uh, was a point in which a development was going to be built 
on that playground. And we joined other community groups and organizations to say, hey, wait a minute, this is our open space. Uh, it is a playground and it should not be used um, as a development site. And, uh, and then also there is uh, a, the Building Height Initiative, which I think that might best be called contextual zoning. And in its simplest terms, we just want neighborhoods to look like neighborhoods. Uh, we um, appreciate um, the mid-scale uh, uh, zoning that is, that is uh, currently in many areas of the Upper East Side, as well as El Barrio, East Harlem. Civitas' catchment area is from 59th Street. Um, and Fifth Avenue all the way to um, 125th Street, uh, you know, down to um, York Avenue and, 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 of course, the FDR Drive. Um, we were uh, really very proud that our town newspaper recognized uh, Civitas. We've, uh, we've been in the community uh, on the Upper East Side, as well as El Barrio, East Harlem, for this is our 41st year, uh, as a matter of fact. The reason why the Audi Award is so um, important to Civitas is because individuals receive that award at, at the recommendation of readers. So readers uh, submit names, submit the names of individuals and organizations whom they believe has made the biggest impact uh, positive on the Upper East Side. And we've appreciated uh, our town's impact in delivering local news because we, we use that and, and uh, we plan our initiatives around what's happening um, within the community and also, uh, as, as we walk the streets, it, consistent with what we see. No, that's great. I'm glad you explained, because that Audi Award is very important. It's very well known in the Upper East Side. And this program is viewed by many people in Manhattan. So they look up the Our Town website, and they can see a little bit more about what the Audi Award is all about. Yes, and it stands for Our Town Thanks You. Oh, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, Our Town thanks you. And we thank Our Town and also uh, the readers of Our Town for uh, nominating Civitas, and we very much appreciate the award. Yes. Well, Civitas does really important work. Um, it's part of many organizations in the Upper East Side to help uh, preserve and improve life. And which we're going to segue over to the community board. Yes. The other, the other organization you've been involved with for quite a few years. Um, so wh how did you get started with the community board? Now that's an interesting story. Charles Millard, he was a city council member at the time. And he called to me three times, <laughs> as a matter of fact. And he said, Sharon, I'd like for you to be on the community board. You know what? I said no. Um, I was uh, really busy um, at the time, and um, I just could not uh, take on another responsibility. Um, but I will also tell you that I never heard of the community board uh, before he called me. So finally, I said to him, okay, yes, I'll do it. And I was thinking at the time, because I really, really liked um, Charles Millard. Um, I, I thought he was a great uh, council member and was uh, very sorry that he uh, did not run again. But I said to myself, okay, um, I'll do this uh, because he thinks it's important and he thinks that I can make a, a contribution to the board. So I was thinking, okay, I will uh, be on the board for perhaps a year, maybe two, then I you know, would have uh, done that and uh, he would have been happy. Uh, it, it's been almost two decades now, and uh, since that time, every day that I participate in a community board meeting, uh, I am grateful to Charles Millard for recommending me 
and also um, I'm grateful to the subsequent council members as well as um, the borough presidents, uh, each of them for, uh, for reappointing me to the board. Um, there hasn't been a day when I, I don't think about uh, Charles Millard and I, and I uh, live up to uh, his expectations for making certain that I contribute uh, to the community board at the highest levels. I was trying to do a little bit of research on your background. You have um, experience in urban planning, is that correct? Yeah, so uh, previously I worked at the Department of City Planning doing environmental reviews of city projects. But I will have to tell you uh, that I, um, I believe that my interest in urban planning uh, really began um, to gel um, as a tenant association president and also the daughter of an urban planner. Um, I watched a building uh, being developed uh, just a, a block away from where I lived. And I said, hmm, I don't like the way that building is being designed. Um, the uh, development that um, I'm referring to uh, was an 80-20 building, and basically 80% of the building is market rate and 20% is uh, for low-income individuals. Uh, what makes this building uh, somewhat unique is that it's one of the last buildings to be built uh, in New York City. Uh, in a way in which they uh, segregated um, the low-income tenants in a separate building, and then that was the 20 percent, and um, the market rate uh, tenants had a, a separate building. After that development uh, was built, uh, there was um, a law that was passed that you cannot segregate uh, the low-income tenants. And so uh, that building is one of the last buildings in, in which you had uh, two different buildings uh, based on income levels, if you will. And um, even when I saw it being uh, developed, uh, and the way that it, it was developed, uh, it, 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 uh, it concerned me um, as a uh, resident association tenant. And uh, I began to uh, look at uh, the built environment in a completely different way. I'll give you an example. The Blood Center, the New York City Blood Center, is currently located on a mid-block. And mid-blocks generally have um, housing units on them. Uh, low scale, it's, it, this particular block where the New York Blood Center is located on the Upper East Side uh, was uh, previously under an RAB zoning. And Civitas was involved in getting uh, certain areas rezoned uh, to uh, better accommodate as well as protect uh, mid mid rise buildings on the mid block. So, uh, you know, basically what that means is it's really an attempt to uh, encourage residential uh, development and to protect residential development um, on the mid block in the avenues. They have um, the larger developments and the larger apartment buildings. Uh, Civitas, as well as some other groups, uh, were opposed to removing the RAB designation to protect the mid-block uh, for that particular site. And uh, because there were uh, groups, including uh, Civitas, that had fought very hard uh, for that in the first place, we lost that battle. Uh, but we have not won, but we have not lost uh, the war, if you will. So we have uh, gotten together uh, community groups and organizations from Community Board 6 
Community Board 8 and Community Board 11. And Civitas uh, created the Eastside Land Use Coalition. And um, because it was out of our uh, concerns about uh, the New York Blood Center that we said to ourselves, you know what, uh, maybe it's, uh, it'll be uh, more helpful if we collaborated across community districts. Because what can happen in uh, Community Board 6 can happen in Community Board 8, can happen in Community Board 11. And one community board might be the canary in the coal mine for other community boards and, and uh, the, the development process along the east side. So we've uh, been uh, very much um, involved with putting together the east side land use coalition. That's fantastic to hear because that, that blood center mess was a threat to the rest of the city. So that's really great to hear that you're being able to organize the community boards. Yes. Earlier you were mentioning about the combination of market rate and I guess subsidized housing or low income housing. Yes. Uh, where does it stand now? Uh, what is kind of the standard when these types of buildings are being developed? Because to me it's very complicated. I'm confused all the time what the rules are. It is a complicated process, but uh, you know, I'll tell you, so for example, the 421A program that uh, was not renewed um, in Albany, uh, there, there are always um, two sides to every equation. So for example, um, developers uh, believe that they very much need to have the subsidies from the 421A program, affordable housing program, in order to uh, develop their buildings. However, um, there are some uh, legislators and, and uh, some uh, community uh, residents and, uh, who, who say, uh, look, you, you get these benefits, but we have not uh, realized uh, the affordable housing units. So, you know, why have this, why have this program? We need to revamp this program. And um, that's what's happening right now. Uh, and, and the 421A is just one program. And you're right, they're complex because to get these subsidies are complex and also to build the affordable units are, are probably you know, unnecessarily complex as well. Yes, and especially in the Upper East Side where there is such a demand for housing for all levels. For sure. Yeah, and when uh, Civitas uh, organized the East Side Land Use Coalition, uh, we, I, you know, I, I put up a, a poll in Zoom. It's so easy to do uh, now that I can figure out Zoom. So I, I put up this poll in Zoom, and I um, asked, "What is, uh, what are your major concerns for your community districts?" Now, um, I, want, I want you to know that we had, uh, you know, for example, um, the board chairs of, of uh, 6, 8, and 11, as well as community board members, uh, block associations from Turtle Bay to the East Harlem Association. And I was very surprised that the number one issue across all three community boards was affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Monica, I was thinking that it was going to be institutional advancement. You know, we just, we just came out of a, a bruising fight with uh, the New York City Blood Center. So I was thinking institutional expansion I was thinking contextual uh, development. Uh, however, that's not only the number one concern across these three community districts, but um, I would wager a bet, if I was a betting woman, that, uh, it, that affordable housing is um, the number one issue across the city as well. Well, especially these days in the headlines of the paper today about the average rent Manhattan is $4,000. $4,000. $4,000. Yeah. 
4,000. Unbelievable. Yes, um, and as high as that is um, in the outer boroughs where people would normally look for and find affordable housing, they're not able to find it either. And in uh, the outer boroughs, the, the rents are, are rising uh, exponentially as they are in, uh, in Manhattan. Yeah, so yeah, housing is, it's always been a hot topic. It's an excruciatingly scorching topic today. Let's you know, take a step back and talk more about the community board itself, because this is retrospective. You know, you, you've had quite a few years on the board, yes. gotten to know its workings. Um, and um, have you noticed um, the, how the community board has operated over the years, either within committee or in the main meetings or just in general? Community Board 8 uh, is, if nothing else, is very consistent, Monica. Uh, the, the committee structure uh, certainly has uh, remained the same. Um, the executive team, uh, team structure, I should say, uh, is, has, has remained the same. Uh, if, if there was a, a suggestion that, that possibly could be made to sort of uh, improve that structure. And by the way, I, I do think that it's it's a pretty good structure. A lot of the work uh, takes place um, at the community level. Uh, uh, resolutions are made and brought up to uh, the full board. There's an opportunity for the full board uh, to uh, vet uh, the subject uh, or the resolution, I should say, even further. Uh, you know what? Um, I think that that process works well. Um, it's a uh, it's a process, in fact, that Civitas uses. Uh, yeah, that our board that. members, our board members work uh, with you know within uh, committee structures uh, structure around um, the Esplanade transportation, uh, for example. What? needs improvement, I think, is probably a rotation of committee chairs uh, so that uh, committee chairs, you know, serve for, say, four or five years and, and, and perhaps step down and allow uh, some other people to step up to leadership positions. So it was very early on, I was chairperson of the housing committee and also uh, the youth committee, and uh, and then there was a, uh, a you know a gap of of, of maybe you know uh, fourteen years, and I'm I'm so happy actually to have been appointed a co-chair of the uh, zoning and land use committee. I just appointed just a couple months ago, as a matter of fact. That is a critically important committee. Yes. Absolutely, for the Upper East Side. Yes. Um, I want to circle back because you brought up Civitas again, and you have um, the board members have committees. How big is Civitas? I didn't ask that question. Yeah, so we have about 20 to 25 board members. Each board member has a committee, and then it's a committee that they're involved with. They're engaged at the community level. They're engaged within Civitas. We have board members that are Upper East Siders, as well as board members that live in El Barrio, East Harlem. And it's, it's within that framework that uh, they meet and they uh, focus on uh, various issues, uh, such as um, double parking. Uh, you know, I, I previously mentioned um, the Esplanade and um, also the Second Avenue subway. We were part of the uh, Second Avenue uh, subway task force that uh, brought the first leg of the Second Avenue subway to the east side. And we're excited uh, to be a part of the next task force for the next leg from 96th Street to 125th Street. Yes, that's very important extension for sure. You start as a volunteer there. How many volunteers do they have? Yes, we have a few volunteers as well. And you know what? I was asked if I uh, would be interested in sitting as a volunteer on the newsletter committee. And I ended up writing articles uh, for Civitas' uh, newsletter. And so to be engaged with Civitas, 
I, it, you, you just bring your interest, Monica. I enjoyed and appreciated uh, Civitas's commitment to both the Upper East Side as well as El Barrio East Harlem. And they're two distinct neighborhoods and they uh, very much, they, they should retain their uh, unique characteristics. And uh, this, is, this is something that uh, we're continuing to focus on. So if people want to learn more about Civitas, is there a website that they can? Wow, How can they thank see you for is asking that. Is the newsletter that. on the website? Yes, our website is civitas, C-I-V-I-T-A-S, N-Y-C dot org. And by the way, you should know that we have a benefit coming up September the 21st, oh. and guess what? We will be honoring the urban rangers as well as the parks department for reintroducing the bald eagle into New York City. And we are so excited and thrilled about this, Monica. And Civitas is going to be a part of New York City's resurgence. We're coming out of the pandemic now, and um, all of the nonprofits and other, other organizations are really looking at how can, can we be a part of, of uh, making New York City stronger and better coming out of this pandemic. And Civitas is, is, is no different. And so we're doubling down on the quality of life issues that impact our neighborhoods, but also um, recognizing a, a team that you wouldn't ordinarily think of when, when you think of New York City. And that's the team that's bringing back the bald eagle, which is so very iconic, Monica, not only to New York City, but also to our beloved nation overall. So it's not just buildings you are worried about, it's also nature and wildlife. Oh yes, That's... definitely. We have an open space and, and parks committee, and, and you're absolutely right about that. Who knew that you could say New York City and the bald eagle in the same sentence? And that's something that we think is good and positive. I'm gonna circle now back again to the community board. Uh, you've served on the board for some time, and one of the changes they're they're putting through are term limits. Yes. And um, what are the pros and cons of the term limits, in your opinion? Sure. As a pro, you get fresh ideas and new faces. Um, I think that that's uh, absolutely critical. Uh, as a con, you lose institutional memory. It can go either way, Monica. I do think that institutional memory is absolutely critical as well. The community boards look at development projects that can span two and a half decades. I mean, real institutional expansion. And by the way, I mean, these are the issues that, that Civitas is, is looking at. Uh, institutional expansion, certainly within um, the Mint Block. But when these institutions come to us, they come to us with plans that span 25 years and a half. So what they have committed uh, to the community to do, uh, you know, sometimes it's important to have that institutional memory. The flip side is I am so happy uh, to see that uh, there are more people on the community on the community board, for example, who uh, want to see who who believe that there is uh, a complementary relationship between a, a pedestrian, um, a, a a driver, as as well as a cyclist. These are complementary modes of transportation. Uh, they're, they're not modes of transportation that fight each other. I really appreciate that we do have people on the board now who say, look, um, you know, we can coexist. And, uh, you know, there was a time in which there was only one primary mode of transportation, but now we have others. We have some scooters, and I know that we need to make sure that 
everyone is behaving respectfully and, and that's um, absolutely uh, critical as well. And uh, we're watching out for each other. Um, I think that uh, that's been helpful on the community board, for example, in passing some uh, resolutions that have been in support of additional bike lanes. That's great to know. And uh, your term will be ending, I guess, in a few years. And uh, I don't know, some people get reappointed. But if you were to no longer be a full board member, do you think you would continue um, as a public member, or do you think the work with Civitas uh, would take over that time you had with the board? I mean, what do you think your engagement would be with the board in the future? I cannot think of, of not being engaged at all. It's in my DNA, and so I will certainly uh, continue to, to be engaged uh, within um, the community board structure whether as a uh, public member or uh, just attending uh, meetings and learning about what's going on um, in the community, but um, also continuing to, to walk the streets and, and see what's happening, feel what's happening. Uh, this is a, a very um, strange time uh, across the board uh, coming out of the pandemic. And it's, uh, you know, there, there's going to continue to be uh, changes uh, in terms of how we do things, uh, in terms of how this, the city evolves. And um, the community board will be a part of that. Civitas uh, will be a part of that as well. And it's, it's exciting, uh, in, in, in fact, thrilling to, to be able to step back and and uh, look at how these changes are, are going to impact our uh, respective communities. And I guess one thing we haven't covered is you have had some tremendous achievements at the community board. I mean, you've single-handedly organized big forums and um, made very insightful comments at the community board. Is there one achievement that you, comes to mind that you're really proud of? You know what, uh, Monica, because I, I see each one as a step and not, not so much um, as an achievement, but uh, it's, it's continuing uh, to make a, what I hope is a, a positive impact. And uh, I, I think, you know, so for example, of one of the, one forum that um, I organized um, with Civitas was a forum around uh, building heights, and and that was a uh, a very successful forum. And you know, again, it's about um, bringing the community along. That's what advocacy is: bringing the community along uh, so that it understands um, the vision, so that the community understands the vision and, and why you are taking the steps that you're taking. And so um, when we say uh, building heights or when we say contextual development or when we say simply we just want neighborhoods to be neighborhoods, the community gets it then. Well, thank you so much, Sharon, for being on the program. And most of all, thank you for all the um, contributions you've made to the community board, and I, I mentioned before, I, your your comments at the community board are so insightful, and highly respected, and um, and I hope you continue that for many years. Well, thank you, Monica. I will also say that I'm trying to keep up with you, <laughs> and I'm trying to keep up with Will Sanchez. You make a great team, and really appreciate all that you're doing to, to keep this program uh, going. I'm, I'm sure it takes up quite a bit of your time as well, and uh, really appreciate all that you both are doing. Well, it's a great pleasure to talk to you and others like you on the board. And thank you, everyone, for watching CB8 Speaks. And if you can, Go to our website, cbm.com, and it has all the information about the community board, a schedule of the meetings of the committees and the full board meeting, and past episodes of CB8 Speaks. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.